You were called to see a 37-week baby with this. We talked about this this morning a little bit. Now what? Silo, OR primary closure, uh, attempt bedside reduction with taped closure, under sedation and intubation, attempt bedside reduction with taped closure without intubation, or something else. It's a good question. It's always 10 o'clock at night. Yeah. That, that's the way my OBGYNs do this. So, so raise your hand if that makes the difference for you. Time of, time of the night. You can be honest. <laughs> All right. So primary silo wins out. Uh, Who said something And that's else? consistent with the data that we shared this morning about what are we doing right now in our practice, but there's been this evolution towards this taped closure. Who said something else? It was an accident? Okay. Nobody has any comments here? Oh, come on. David Rothstein, are you in the room? Mark, Mark Wilkan, are you in the room? <laughs> Who here has a problem with... Go ahead, Mark. Go ahead. I got it. Could we get all the mics turned on? I, I feel like it's like, come on down. Yeah. <laughs> Rice is right. No, I, I pick D because I think you walk up to the NICU and before the nurses notice that you're messing with the baby and before they sit there and tell you that you got to do all these things and they need 15 IVs and everything else, you can go up there, put on some clean gloves and just see if it goes back in. And if it goes back in, you're done. Uh, you can get it in before they finish their IVs, right? That's my okay. goal. Yeah. So do you, use, do you intubate them? No. So full disclosure, probably nine times out of ten, the baby's already intubated when they get there. I'm not quite sure why, but they seem to be. I don't know if it, has everybody else experienced that. I see a lot of heads nodding. Does anyone intubate? But not for this. this. I don't intubate to do this. Nobody. Well, yes. Yeah. What? Yeah. If it does, so you'll try without intubation. You'll stop, wait, try again, instead of just leaving a silo. Yeah, or, or you pop a silo on. Because it costs more money. <laughs> David. Who puts a silo it. in everybody automatically? Let, let, let David oh, respond to that. I'm going to ask a question on Lauren Berman's behalf. Who has a toolkit for gastroschisis approach, and how do you have a coordinated effort with your neonatologists, your OBGYNs, and the nurses? What is a toolkit? Lauren, can you take that one? No, I mean, sorry, an algorithmic approach and a, a, um, so that when the baby's being induced, you know what's happening. You have a toolkit? Yeah, you've published on it. <laughs> yeah, we do. So uh, I would agree with the comment. That try to get it in. If you get it in, you get it in. It's great. We don't intubate, but if we get there and the neonatologists have already given some morphine, well, then we're going to have to because that child's going to stop breathing. So in this case, uh, this is the step. So they had the... Um, reduction, primary reduction, and uh, taped closure without intubation, and you can see your results. But what if you had bedside bowel that despite the effort you guys are just talking about to reduce, you couldn't, then oftentimes a silo is placed at that point. So three days later, the bowel is reduced, and now your plan is go to the OR for closure, or now try the bedside tape closure again. Everybody got a clicker? If anyone has a strong opinion, tell me so I can run to you. Hey, hey Mac? Yes. Uh, Brian, Brian Gilchrist from Brooklyn. Yeah. Blair? Uh, I, uh, I want to just point out one thing to, okay. to all the speakers that have been going. When you have great centers, as you do here at Children's Hospital and Bond, Show results. And all, the, and all the talks that have been given from cervical spines and sending kids home and, and not worrying about them. If you're in the Bronx or if you're in Brooklyn, it's a whole different world. And a kid like this with a lot of bowel out, I'd probably just take to the operating room and primarily put it in. Uh, sometimes you don't have the resources that some of the centers have. And I think some of these young guys who are coming up may not be in these places where you have all these accoutrements that a lot of us don't have. And some surgeons operate outside the United States. Oh, there's Eric Hansen. <laughs> yeah, I think that. I'll wait my turn. Um, yeah. I get, I got, my oldest kid was four days sitting with bowel out at another hospital, got IV. That's the only one that, sur that he survived. Um, we had zero survivor in 2011, by 2011. 
Now our survival is about 50 to 60 percent in Kenya. Um, we use it out of an Asian paper. We put silos on. We reduce them slow, rapidly, actually, forced reduction almost, if you will, over over a couple of days. And then we always save the umbilical stump. We tucked it in. We tucked it under. We didn't tape. We 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 avoided intubation at all costs. That's what killed our kids. So even this kid. Well, not that kid. That, yeah. That's terrible. Um, Sorry, I keep trying to get results to pop up, and it won't. Yeah, that, so I think that, that if you can show that, results, that'd be I great. I think that, you know, in a, in a developing world context, having a silo that I reused, I saved them. I told all the nurses I had to keep it. I went and soaked it. I saved it again. And you, and you can get these kids reduced. You can get the umbilical stump that I leave long, 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 wrap it around, tegaderm over it. Even if the bowel peeks through, ignore it. Leave the tegaderm. The bowel peeks through. My, my partner said... I said, you can't do that. He said, yes, you can. Watch. My Kenyan partner. It works. Fantastic. Thank you for sharing that. So this is one we need more information on. It's a 50-50 split about what's the right thing or best thing. What if the patient has this? Dissect out the matted bowel to try to make sense of damage, create a stoma, close the gastroschisis, put on a silo and watch and wait, or something else. Any questions about the case while you're deciding? Yeah, so I knew you were going to ask. So I'll just describe it. The bowel looked necrotic. Um, could have been stained, but it looked pretty dead. Yeah, go. Yeah, edit. If you could go show that again. I think I got it. Oh, okay. Looked dead. But it was a matted, matted bunch of bow, all stuck together. All right, so it looks like put on a silo and watch and wait and create a stoma. Okay, so the majority said D to put on a silo. Who thinks that's nuts? Nobody? Oh, come on. We have one. Someone thinks it's Well, here's, there will hand one up down here. Microphone's right over here. We need to know why it's nuts. Please. So I think that, uh, so uh, Mustafa Kabir from uh, Chalk Children's Hospital, Orange County. Like um, think I think that, it. you know, first of all, my experience with dead bowel in this is somewhat limited, but of the few cases that I've had, um, I've been able to bring out a stoma, and that way it sort of addresses some of the problems right away. So I think that once you're there and you can see whether you can dissect it and get a stoma is probably the first thing I would try. You think it's, it's hard it's to pull out a stoma in the matted bunch of bowel or no? I'm sorry, I didn't hear you say it again. Is it hard to find, to pull out a stoma because it's all matted together, all the bowel? Yeah, there's nothing easy about it. So yes, it's hard, but I, I think that, you know, if you have dead bowel, or at least what I can gather from that, uh, you're going to have ongoing leakage of content, and it's going to, I think, potentially make that matting and inflammation worse. I will say it's not always a pretty stoma. Right. Over here. That's the one. I'm Sharif Emil, Montreal. I just want to make a quick comment about the other scenario we discussed. A lot of the confusion, I think, um, is coming from the fact that this is very dynamic. We really don't know what the best solution is. I mean, is it better to intubate and sedate the baby and do a sutureless closure? Or is it better to fail at a sutureless closure and put a silo because you don't want to intubate and sedate the baby? We don't have answers to these. And I think time will tell which one of these is really the best. Um, so somebody needs to do some prospective research. <laughs> yeah, well, I think it's, it's happening. Yeah, good. But in any case, the, the picture you showed, it's very difficult to come up with an algorithm. Each of these patients is really unique. I think you can leave matted, obstructed bowel behind, but you can't really leave necrotic bowel behind. That patient's not going to do well. So you should resect the bowel, try to close. I would try to avoid a stoma. You can often still close, put it in a silo. You don't have to wait six weeks like all the textbooks say. In a couple of weeks, you'll be able to look at that bowel. It's going to look a lot better. You'll make sense of it, and you could probably establish continuity. What do we do? We'll in this a case, silo. a silo was placed. So now what? Reduce the bowel in the silo? Wait a period of time and explore? Maybe it's seven days? <laughs> Go off service and hand this over to your partner? <laughs> Something else. All right, results. So wait a period of time and explore. 
So what does that mean? Who answered that? Is, are you talking a couple days? Because the kid's got a silo right now. So how long would you wait for those of you? Because most of you said that. Who wants to be brave and nobody? Who says one day? Go the next day. Two days. Three days. Three days. I'm seeing about three days starting to happen. Four days. Five days. Six days. Five or six. Okay. Football so, so score. Seven. Sounds like five or six, four or five or six days, a lot of people would then go, leave the kid in the silo, wait four or five days, and then go back in and look. In this case, the case was wait, uh, observed for two days and went in and did a, a primary closure. So seems like earlier can work, at least in this case. Yeah. So this kid's now uh, six weeks out and is, has an atresia, basically, is acting obstructed, and we're just going to wait a couple more weeks and take the kid back. Yep. How about this one? Oh, comment? Yep. So the dead bowel miraculously underwent the Lazarus procedure. Yeah. <laughs> was it just meconium stained instead of dead? No, I think it was dead. I think oh. it just scarred. It just involuted. Yeah. In two days. No, in four I, weeks. I don't think you can tell if it's dead. I agree. I, I, th I think that uh, I think that, that bowel is probably still alive. Otherwise, it would have perforated, right? And I think that we can't tell, which is why I would never receive. You have an opponent. I love that. What do you think? It's only because he trained me. <laughs> no, I, that part that was floppy and green. I mean, that that's dead. <laughs> that's not necessarily the floppy bowel. green equals no, dead. It is some, if you if you when you dissect that out, sometimes that's just dead green, or it's just omentum. It's thrombosed omentum mm. that's laying across the bowel. I've seen that before, where it looks like it is, and you think it's dead bowel, and it's really not. I don't think you know. I think you put a silo on and see what happens. And I've never seen one of these. Uh, I, I don't think I've seen one of these perforate. I'm not gonna say never, because I'm sure it's happened. Mm, I don't know that it's dead. Uh, that's fine. Yeah. Arun Patel, Corpus Christi. So I would encourage you guys, there's one paper so far on this immunofluorescence we've been using for the last four years. Uh, I don't want to say a company name, but SPY basically. And we inject these kids. So we've had similar cases. I would resect the dead bowel. Uh, we put a SPY on them. You can see exactly, no more guesswork. You see what's dead, what's not dead. And you can come back and then drop them in and come back three weeks later, treat them like a regular treasure. So I would encourage you guys, there's lots of tools available to check blood flow without having to guess about the bowel. Okay, one, one more comment over here and then we'll move on. <clears throat> you're, you're overlooking two basic facts. One is the meconium in these babies is the same as the meconium ileus. Your first job should be to use acetylcholine and irrigate the bowel until you've got it empty. Secondly, if you stuff it all back in, you're gonna create increased abdominal pressure. You'll reduce cardiac output you'll push up the diaphragms. All you have to do is take them to the operating room, get the bowel irrigated, stretch the abdominal wall with your fingers, and only close skin. Do it all in one step. If there's dead bowel or perforated bowel, take care of it right then and there. Don't screw around for two or three days. You sound like a well-trained pediatric surgeon to me. <laughs> all right, the next one. All right, how about this? You can see this is a gastroschisis with an intestinal atresia. So I don't know if you all can see on the picture of the atresia, but there's a, can you see back there? Can everyone see it? There's an atresia, trust us. <laughs> oh yeah. A cord. Okay, so how do you handle an atresia? So gastros standard gastroschisis with an atresia. What's your, what do you do? Here we have resectatresia, primary anastomosis, then primary reduction and closure. Resectatresia, primary anastomosis and silo, stoma and silo, stoma, reduction and closure, reduce, close, and expect secondary operation. It's kind of wordy. So the majority feel that you reduce, close, and come back a later day. Any discussion from people in the other camps? 
I would go on. In this case, uh, primary reduction and cord closure and plan to return another day, just as the majority said.